webinar on teaching with Google Earth online on Tuesday. Hello. There there on Tuesday, there was a main webinar that was held that sort of overviewed both the function and applications that Google Earth has been used in geosciences. And now this GSA and NAGT uh, webinar series is continuing with an opportunity to do a bit more hands on um, learning related to Google Earth with the same presenters that you heard from on Tuesday. If you're joining us for the first time and didn't catch the Tuesday webinar, you um, can see the recording of that on um, the GSA website and that link was sent to you and we can send it again after this. So I think there's not much else that I need to say and I'd like to pass it over to Steve and Drew. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Steve Whitmeyer, um, professor at James Madison University. Um, and I, along with, with Drew Laskowski, Drew, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Drew Laskowski. I'm an assistant professor at Montana State University. So what we'll, uh, what we'll do today is, for those of you that were with us on Tuesday, we spent pretty much the whole time giving people a demonstration of how you could use Google Earth for virtual um, teaching and virtual field experiences. And the idea of today's webinar, uh, which is an hour long, will be to actually walk you through how you do some of that stuff and how you create some of those files. Um, there, as we explained on Tuesday, uh, there are three primary platforms for Google Earth. There's Google Earth on the web, which works on the Firefox, Chrome, Edge, and Opera browsers. It doesn't really work very well with Safari. It gets kind of funky. Um, and then there's the desktop version of Google Earth. Uh, which is the one that used to be called Google Earth Pro, and it's been around for a while. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to each of those platforms. Uh, today, we'll be spending most of our time with Web Google Earth and talking about how to create uh, your own content and your own tours and presentations and KML files within Web Google Earth. Part of the reason for that is desktop Google Earth has been around for a long time, and there's actually a lot of material already out there in the form of various tutorials for desktop Google Earth. Um, I will highlight uh, where you can find some of that material uh, to look at in, in just a second. Um, if you don't have uh, web or desktop Google Earth prepared, you might uh, want to, um, I'm sorry, if you don't have, if you don't have desktop downloaded, you might want to do that at some point. Uh, web Google Earth, as long as you have Firefox or Chrome or something like that, you should be able to access that no problem. The other thing you might want to do at some point is access your group Google Drive. Um, so if you have a Google Drive account, uh, at one point I will show you how you can access that and basically use that to host your web Google materials. Um, I did put a uh, link uh, where you can download webinar files. I think it's on the screen behind me or above me. Um, if you're looking at my screen right now, uh, it's also in the chat. It has been put in the chat box a couple of times. And the handouts, what you'll see there are three things. You'll see a uh, basically a, a Word document of web links. You'll see a get started file, which you can get from, from uh, the Google site, uh, but it shows you kind of the basics of getting started with web Google Earth. And then I also put just a, uh, a generic CSV file um, so that at some point you can explore the symbols tool for creating your own strike and dip symbols uh, for KML files. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna share my screen um, show you a little bit about those two files that you should be able to download um, and then we'll get off and running. Okay, so sharing my screen.
Okay, hopefully you can see my screen and there's two files uh, that are up on the screen. The one on the left is this Weblinks GE webinar Word document. And there's a whole list of links in there. They should all be live if you open this in Word. So you should be able to click on any of these uh, and get to, to that location in your browser. I'll briefly go through what's on here. Uh, the general access to Google Earth of any variety is that top link, general Google Earth site. Um, information about KML, which is keyhole markup language. It's the scripting language that you can use to create content in Google Earth. Uh, that's the general Google developer site for KML. It's got their KML reference, just about everything you'd ever want to know about KML. Uh, more useful perhaps for what we're going to uh, be doing or what you might want to be doing. At the top there are resources for desktop Google Earth. And the first one of those is especially useful. I'm going to click on that and take us there because what I'd like to do is uh, point out this is the site on the Teach the Earth, the page on the Teach the Earth site, a guide to using Google Earth in a geoscience classroom. This was designed quite a few years ago by Glenn Richard, uh, but it's been updated by Diana and Beth recently uh, to, I mean, as you know, these things change quite a bit over the years. And so they did a really nice job of, of mo you know, as far as I can tell, bringing this all up to the current state. Uh, there might be a couple of old links still in there, but it's pretty good. Um, what is Google Earth becoming familiar? How to teach a user guide working with KML examples from the Google community. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff in here. And this is a really good place to start if you want to start with using desktop Google Earth for uh, the geoscience classroom for exercises, things like that. Um, I will mention one other thing. There is a link here as well for, um, that addresses Google Earth Engine, uh, which is a completely different product, okay? Google Earth Engine is a way to deal with a lot of really large data sets like atmospheric data sets um, and to process a lot of data. It is not Google Earth as we would recognize Google Earth. Um, it would take a completely different webinar to go into Google Earth Engine. So we aren't gonna cover that today. Google Earth's the same, I mean, Google Maps kind of the same thing. There's some re relationships between maps and, and Earth, but going deeply into Google Maps again is, is a different topic. Okay, so I wanted to highlight that one. Um, let me go back to some of the other things that are on this uh, page here. Uh, things that we highlighted Tuesday are some of these other sites. GEOD was a project I was involved in, and there are some Google Earth resources there and some Google Earth uh, uh, educational exercises there. A um, couple of other people who have done some useful exercises that we highlighted on Tuesday are Tom Blenkinsoff and Barb Tewksbury. Those are there. But then down here, these are the ones for Web Google Earth. And Right up here at the top, the stuff from Google Earth EDU is really useful. If you go to any of these links, the education link, the support link, um, this getting started guide, which is the one that I over he ha have over here on the right side of my screen, all of this stuff is available through the Google EDU site. And you can get tutorials on doing just about anything um, that you need to in Web Google Earth. We'll go over a bunch of that stuff today, but Remember, these are the places to come back to, um, to get uh, the resources and, and the guides and how to do this stuff. Um, the symbols tool, I will talk about. That's something we developed to create uh, 3D oriented strike and dip symbols. And we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, there are some great custom KML code examples for web Google Earth. Ben Vanderplein has a nice blog that goes into a bunch of that. Josh Williams has done all sorts of Google Earth stuff. You can get totally lost in his web page, um, but there's a lot of really cool stuff in there. So useful as a resource. And then down here on the second page, these are some examples we're gonna be uh, talking about and probably showing. We showed them on, on Tuesday, uh, but these are nice examples of virtual field trips in WIMP Google Earth. One that I did for the Blue Ridge Province one that Ben Vanderplein did for the Maryland Appalachians. 
If you haven't seen the AGU Streetcar to Subduction site, that's a really cool one. It's got several different tours in there or field trips in there. And then a couple of exercises that were designed for virtual field education for the, you know, the, the scenario we're all in this summer. And those are down here at the bottom. The Sandy Hollow one is one that, uh, that Drew designed and he'll talk a little bit about he built some of that later on. And then there's contact stuff for us at the bottom. So hopefully you've been able to get a hold of this, uh, this file that's got all the links um, to help you sort of work along with us, play along with us as we make our way through. Okay. Um, any questions before we get started in web Google Earth? I have one quick question, and I don't know whether this is um, easy to answer now or not, but I, I made a bunch of um, Google Earth field trips for my course that just wrapped up that were on the desktop. And when I try to import the KMZ files into um, the web version, all the embedded photos and all the embedded videos have disappeared. Right. So, so how does one fix that problem? <laughs> yeah. So here's one of the one of the issues between the two platforms. And thank you for bringing that up because this is one of the major issues. Web Google Earth and Desktop Google Earth handle photos and videos completely differently. You cannot transfer from one to the other. If you create it in web, it won't work on desktop. And if you create it in desktop, it won't work on web. So there's no easy solution unless you want to go into your KML files and completely re-script how it handles photos. Um, it's challenging. It's, it's an unfortunate scenario, but that is, you are right. That's what happens. Um, okay. Let's dive in to web Google Earth. And so, if you go to, let me go back to the sheet. You know, if you, if we start with the top link right there, google.com slash earth, you should get to a page that looks something like this. What I'm going to do here is um, switch my screen share to only show my web browser. All right. So, I think I have to stop my share and then restart my share. And I'm going to do it this way. Okay, so hopefully what you see now is just my web browser. And we're going to launch Earth, right? So here we go. So this takes you right into web Google Earth. And you get this intro page, which we can skip. And you're presented with something like this. Um, down here in the bottom right, you'll see your standard sort of zoom in and out control, zoom out, zoom in. Uh, this functions just like desktop Earth used to function. Uh, I'm partial to Virginia. So, you know, I can... I can zoom into about where I am here. Um, and of course, just like in desktop earth, you can zoom in, you can rotate your view and get the three dimensional view, all that sort of stuff. You can search for locations, um, all those sorts of things. Uh, the other thing you'll notice on here is over on the bottom left are these two uh, icons that allow you to add place marks or draw lines. Okay, so this is how you would do, or one way to do both of those things in web Google Earth. There are other ways to do that, which I will highlight in a minute. On the upper left side, you see a vertical strip of icons. Okay, the top one is the menu. And if you click on that, it'll then show you all the icons and give you a name so you know what they are, right? There's the search icon, Voyager, which is built-in content. Uh, in Google Earth, it used to be the layers, the, the lower layers in the desktop version. But, you know, it's some, there's some interesting stuff in Voyager worth exploring. 
projects is where you would build and load your own Google Earth projects. Map style controls a little bit about how you see uh, what's on the screen. Photos, basically, if you turn that on, it'll allow you to see panoramia photos that are already on the web and built in. I usually don't use them, so I leave it off. Settings are just basically how Google Earth appears, whether you want it to fly to different locations or appear instantaneously, how big you want to make the cache or the memory that Google, is, Google Earth is using. Feedback can help, there you go. Help is useful actually. If you, have, if you want to load help topics for how to do certain things, that help button is useful. Um, I'm gonna to go to map style really quickly because if you notice um, on my screen here, it's got all these labels and roads and all that. I tend to favor very clean looking maps when I wanna run things. So you can choose a custom map layout or map appearance, everything map appearance, which gets kind of crazy or clean, which is nothing. And I tend to favor clean. So I usually set mine to clean. Um, the other thing that's down here is grid lines. If you're doing something at the level of the full globe, grid lines can be useful if you wanna see Latin long grids. Some exercises you might wanna do that. Okay, but the main thing you're gonna be concerned with in building content is this little projects icon here, third from the bottom. And when you click on that, you get, first of all, it gives you a little, automatically pops up this little introduction to creation in Earth. Again, this is part of the Help Center. Uh, but it allows you to open existing files, again, from a Google Drive account, if you have one, or you can import a KML file from the computer. Um, there are two things you can do within Google Earth, Web Google Earth. You can either work with KML files, in which case you save the KML file somewhere, either on your Google Drive account or on your computer. And then if other people, um, if you want other people to be able to use that KML file, you have to give them access to it. You have to send it to them or you have to give them access to it on your Google Drive account. The other thing you can do is build a project directly linked with Google Drive, in which case you actually can just give somebody the link. And it'll, if they have that link, they can go directly to your project and it'll open Web Google Earth directly. This is really handy with students um, and other people because they don't have to mess around with loading anything or any of that stuff they can go directly there. The disadvantage of building a project directly in um, linked to Google Drive is it's not a KML file. You can't actually get into it and change it as you could a regular KML file outside of Google Earth. So some of the customizing stuff like fixing photos, if you want it to be able to work on web and desktop, you would have to do that from a KML file. You couldn't do it directly from a linked project. Okay, the other thing that's here is the create button. And the create button, again, you can create a KML file or you can create a project. What I'm gonna do here is start by creating a project in Google Drive. So if I click on that, First of all, I have to sign into my Google Drive account. So I'm gonna do that. And then we go back to the Google Earth page, but now I'm signed in. In fact, if I look up here, it shows that I'm signed into my account. And now I go back and I create a project in Google Drive. And you'll notice it says auto saved seconds ago. So it automatically saves and updates to your Google Drive account as you work on it. So what you see, again, this is the projects menu. You can close it and open it. I am working on a project and then there's the little pencil here that lets me edit that project. So, 
you know, at the very least, I probably want to say, give it a title. For some reason, I always capitalize the second letter. And then for NAGT GE webinar. Okay. So there's my project. The other things that are up here are the link to share my project with anybody. You know, anybody that I gave the link to could then see my project. I can trash it, right? I can delete the project. If I delete it and it's linked to my Google Drive account, I can just go back to it on my Google Drive account. This only deletes it out of this browser session of Google Earth. It does not delete it permanently. Or even though I created this as a Google Earth project, I can still export it as a KML file if I decide that I want that. So I can almost back it up on my computer as a KML file if I want. And it'll work just the same way as the project, except it won't have that direct link that I can give to other people. Once I start changing it, though, as a KML file, I cannot go back and make it a linked project again. You have to work in a linked project all the way through creating it if that's the format you want to use. I've never tried that report inappropriate comment thing. So, but anyway. Okay. Let's just create a couple of things um, very quickly. So, Let's say I want to go to Massanutten Mountain. So I can search for it. So it took me to a location in Massanutten Mountain that I searched to. I could add it to the project. You see right there, I searched for it. I can click on add to the project. It'll create a location. And now you see I have it linked here in my project as a location. And it puts a little pin there for me. Now, let's say I don't like yellow. So one of the things you can do for any point or place mark you create, you can delete it. You can turn it off so you don't see it, but you can also edit it, which is the pencil. So any feature is editable and it pulls up this editing page. I can change the size of my place mark. I can make it smaller. I can make it big. Um, I can't make it disappear in web Google Earth. You can do that in desktop, but you can't do that in web. Uh, I can change the color. And uh, we'll go with red. And I can upload a custom icon if I want to make it something different. There's a whole mitt full of icons that they have in here, although they're all this sort of placemark shape. They don't have any other shapes, but for the built in stuff. And then there are some advanced options. I can change the label color. Maybe I'll make that yellow. Or the label size. Um, what else? I can move it. I really want it up there. You'll see the Latin, the longitude change as I move it around. Um, you can pin it to the ground, you can make it relative to the ground, you can make it absolute in space, so this can set the altitude of it. Um, the other thing, though, that's really useful is you can change the view. So right now, this is a bird's eye view. What if I really wanted to get in here and highlight the spot really close to the ground? Maybe I want to highlight that road over there. What I really want to do is look at that. I can go down here and capture this view. Now, every time I go to this place mark, it'll capture that view. And you might say, well, that's not all that exciting. Well, I mean, maybe what you really want to do is show it three-dimensionally, right? And 
Maybe that's the view you want to capture. Well, that's kind of cool. Or better yet, maybe I know that I'm in a place that's got good street view imagery. And this little guy down here in the bottom right, he's called Pegman. You can drag Pegman over, and if you see a blue line on the screen, that means there's street view imagery there. So I can drop Mr. Pegman right there. And now I get the Google Street View imagery. Actually, I know there's an outcrop right down this road, so let's go there. Could be completely vegetated. Yeah, so there's an outcrop there. That happens to be the Cub Sandstone, if any of you are familiar with this neck of the woods. But I could take a look at that, and I could capture the view. So now, I'm going to leave the place mark. I'm going to go back to a generic Google Earth view. Reset it to north. If I click on the place mark, come on. There we go. All right. What I have to do is I have to present it. So I'll present it, and that'll take me into the view I had. There we go. So since I just clicked on present, what the present button does is it takes all of your place marks and shows them effectively as a slideshow. So let's put one more place mark in here just to kind of illustrate what I mean. And I'm going to go over to, uh, where do I want to go? Now we'll stay in the same place. We'll go into Massanutten Mountain here. There happens to be a very cool overlook that I am sure I could get into. I thought there would have been a, There it is, it's right there. And I thought that there was, yeah. The other thing, see these little blue dots? Those are photo, photospheres that users have captured and they work just like Street View. You can go in there and actually look at the photosphere. So for example, this is an overlook on Massanutten Mountain and it's a 360 degree view. So. It's a pretty cool spot. What I could do is I could, since I know where that is now, I can create a place mark. I can put it right there. I'll call it uh, Overlook. I'll save it. I'll go in and edit it. And what I'm going to do is grab one of those photospheres and I'm going to capture the view. Okay. So, once again, let's go back to where we started. We now have two spots here and if I present, I'm starting to build my tour presentation. Okay, I start with the first one, which is the street view image along the road. You'll notice down here, it now shows that I'm looking at slide one of two. I can go to the next one. And that'll take me to this one. And while users are there, I mean, this is a 360 degree image. You can spin it around and see some of the local outcrops, which are and sandstone, nice scolithos fossils in there. Um, and see Page Valley, see the Blue Ridge Mountains on the horizon. You can also jump to specific places by clicking on the table of contents. So this is the sort of view that students would most likely be using when they run through a virtual field trip. Steve, if you don't okay, mind me jumping in for a second here. Um, go for it. 
Yeah, I found it really useful to put in those place marks that are actually just screens with written descriptions. So if you wanted to provide some geological context right there in your tour, you know, under new feature, you can just add a, <laughs> that's my dog barking. Um, you can just add it, a screen that has some, some writing, or if you're more, if you want to be more complicated, you can embed HTML code to get images and things of that nature. So let me show you what, uh, what Drew's referring to. Let's say we, we want to have a, an introductory slide. So let's, uh, let's create one. Um, just make another place mark here. We'll call this uh, intro to the field trip. And we'll edit it. And right down here, we'll say, you know, welcome to the Massanutten Mountain field trip, right? Um, uh, this is a great place to visit key local geology. Um, blah, blah. And you can keep going, okay? Um, if you choose small info box, now when you go to the site, first of all, I would want this to be first, right? So I'm going to slide just click on it and drag it to the top. Now it becomes my first slide. And if I click on it, I get a little pop-up box balloon over here that has the title and then any of the descriptive stuff that I want to put in there. Um, you, there's, you can also make this a full um, sidebar down the whole screen if you have a whole lot of stuff you want to say. So if I went in and edited this, instead of calling it a small info box, I could call it a large info box. And then when you would go in there, you get a whole sidebar to work with. So why might you want to use a whole sidebar? Well, maybe you really want to add an image, a picture. So I have a few pictures, um, actually not from this location, but there's some pretty cool pictures. So let's say I want to add a picture to this stop. I click on the camera. I drag my image in there. It uploads it. And there it is. Um, I'll just stick one more picture in there. You can store up to eight pictures, by the way. Now, what's neat about the way web Google Earth stores these pictures is I'm uploading pretty big files here. They're like four megabyte pictures. I just didn't bother downsizing them. But your um, Google Drive project only stores this little small snapshot of it directly in the project. The full blown link to the image is stored on the web in a different location of Google's. And so it doesn't make your project file size huge. So it still runs quickly, which is really nice. Okay, now I got out of editing. If I go back to enter to the field trip, now I've got my pictures. There are the two pictures. If you click on them, you get the full size. And you can use that as a carousel to move through those as well. This is a little stony man. It's got nothing to do with, with where my place mark is, but it's just a good picture. And that's me when I was a little bit younger. Anyway. Okay, I'm gonna do one more thing, and then I'm gonna stop, ask for some questions, and I think maybe turn it over to Drew, because after a few questions, uh, it might be worth talking about some more advanced stuff. Drew, maybe you could also cover uh, doing lines and polygons too, um, when I turn it over to you, if that's okay. Sounds good. The other thing I will show you is, a lot of times you want field trips to start 
with an introductory full screen slide. And there's a way to do that. If you go up to new feature here, okay, you can add a full screen slide. Okay, so if I do that, this is going to be field trip start. Again, I could put some text about the trip. And then down here where you see the camera, what it's going to do is it is going to basically take an image of mine and make that the full screen. So again, I'm just grabbing an image here. I guess this is a big one because it's taking a few minutes to upload. Um, you notice at the top here, you could do a Google image search. If you want to do a video, you could link to YouTube. Um, there are various other things you can stick in this location. Okay, here we go. So now I've created a full screen slide. But field trip start again, I want to be at the start. So now when I present, the first thing I'm going to see is that introductory slide. I'm a structural geologist, so this kind of an image is pretty cool. But you notice down here, here's the title. Here's some information about the trip. Um, if I were going to do this for real, I would actually probably have some big lettering on the image itself as the introduction to my field trip. So I would take the, I would take the image into a, an, a like Photoshop or Illustrator or something and create my own text over the top of it that would be a little bit more of a, of a title at the very top of the screen. Um, but then we start there and then we start moving through the things we've created. Okay. I think this is a good place to pause here. Um, any quick questions before I turn this over to Drew? I just, this is Beth. Oh, sorry. Um, I didn't, when I went to the overlook, I didn't see the blue spheres. Is there anything that I have to click to see them? Sure. You have to go down and see, did you drag the peg man over? So no. what you have to do is in order to see where street view imagery is or where photospheres are, this little guy down here in the bottom right, who's peg man, if you click on him and drag him, these blue lines appear and the lines are for street view imagery and the dots, which there's one up here, those are the photospheres. Okay, yes, it works. Thank you. Uh, yep. And just in case anyone's not um, keeping an eye on the chat box, there have been some questions coming by that Drew has been answering, such as like, how do you get, uh, what are photospheres um, and things like that. So if people have their chat box open, they might be getting a little side info that would be useful. Fantastic. And Drew, I'll take over with the chat box and you can take over the screen. How's that? Yeah, sounds good. Let's see if I can figure this out. Okay, so. There we go. All right, you see my screen now. A um, couple things I wanted to highlight. I introduced sort of conceptually the Sandy Hollow exercise I developed, I developed for the Montana State field course. And I wanted to just give a little bit more details on how I created some of these things. So Steve did a nice job at describing how you create these waypoints um, in a project. So for instance, you know, I'm in the stratigraphy focused portion of the exercise at Sandy Hollow. I started off here with a full screen slide that, ex that told students what to do, um, gave them instructions and you can tailor these to uh, do any number of things. Um, to, if you wanted to, for instance, draw a line or a shape, or you could even have students, you know, if you wanted students to map in contacts by looking at well-exposed geology from imagery, you can click this button over here, new feature, draw a line or shape, and you can just start drawing. So you could even have students download your copy of the KML 
load it in their Google Earth, draw some lines, save it as their version, and submit that for grading. Right, so just like in the desktop version, you can draw lines and polygons. To give the to give a really um, in-depth field trip experience, one of the most useful things is to embed things like YouTube videos. So luckily I was able to actually go to the field for this particular exercise and film some outcrop investigations with Devin Orm, who's also a professor at Montana State. And I was able to embed those videos in the KML file. So basically in, the, in this exercise, we checked out the outcrop, got some really nice zoomed in views of the rocks. But let me show you how you would actually do that. Um, I used YouTube because YouTube does play nicely with uh, Google Earth. You know, they're both Google products. So I have a bunch of videos here I've uploaded. I won't go through the actual capture of the video, of course. And you'll notice that my videos are unlisted. So you're not gonna be able to see these on a YouTube page unless you have the specific link. So, to embed this, let's actually go to the video on YouTube. There's a share button and there's an option here to get an embed code, which is just generating a little bit of HTML for you. So I copy that embed code from my YouTube video, go back to Google Earth, and I can add a new feature. That particular video I filmed up here in sort of the, uh, right along the nose of this north plunging anticline. Call that intro video. And now it's appearing in my project. Click that pencil there to edit it. And then if I switch that text box to, text box to HTML, paste in my embed code, if all goes well here, that box will appear and load the YouTube video. which for some reason is taking a little while. I believe that's the, the steps to take to do that. Um, Steve chime in if I made a mistake there, but I can, I can also just show you what the end product looks like for this one. Yeah, I have, I have actually just searched, I you know if I'm logged into YouTube, I can just search for my videos and paste them right in. So I haven't had to use the Im embed code to do that. Okay, so you can just click on this. Oh, that's right. That's how I did it. Um, thank you for reminding me of the much easier way to do that. Yeah. Where you have that. this photograph icon here, you can click that and you can either embed images from Google image search or a YouTube video or something from your Google Drive, etc. So you can find your YouTube video here and embed it. The other thing I've been experimenting with is Gigapan photos. And I know there's another GSA NAGT webinar that is going to run that is talking about the use of Gigapan photos. These are essentially really high resolution panoramic images. And what it allows you to do is capture large outcrops. In a very similar manner, you can actually take, you can hit the share button on your Gigapan page, click on embed and it will give you that code to embed your Gigapan image in Google Earth. So that particular Gigapan image was captured on this outcrop here. It's the Morrison Formation. 
and it will open up this panel that allows students to get a higher resolution view of the outcrop. And this is similar to the concept of those photospheres. Photo spheres. Um, someone in the chat asked a question about actually creating those. I know that on my cell phone, which is an Android cell phone uh, made by Google, I actually have the option to capture those spherical panoramas. So you could do those, you could generate your own versions of those as well and use those to create some content. And then one final thing I wanted to mention that was brought up on um, Tuesday was going between ArcGIS and Google Earth. So here I just brought up um, ArcGIS Pro and I have an image overlaying here that I captured with a drone. This is my neighborhood in Bozeman, just doing a test of capturing an ortho mosaic. So for whatever reason you wanted to capture some really high resolution imagery that wasn't available through Google. And if you can get it into ArcMap or Arc Pro, you can use the toolbox to generate KMLs by exporting from ArcMap. So here I'm using the geoprocessing tool called Layer to KML. Hey, uh, um, yeah. yeah. Drew, Drew, oh, all yeah, yeah. Your browser. I think I'm only sharing Firefox. Apologies. Yeah. Was that what you were going to tell me? Yep. All right, let me fix that really quick. Okay, so yeah, Arc Pro here. I have a, a raster image in Arc Pro. If I wanted to get that into ArcGIS Online, I could use the geoprocessing tool layer to KML. And I simply exported that as a KML right here on my messy desktop. And before we began here, I actually just uploaded that by going into projects. And I opened that KML file and it brought that image right into Google Earth. So this is another type of thing that you could do. You could take data that you already have in uh, Esri products and you could bring it over into Google Earth. And that's just might be a little bit easier for your students to actually view the materials, um, works on more computers, don't have to worry about licensing issues, et cetera. So I think that was uh, basically it for what I wanted to cover. I know I kind of zoomed through that quickly. So if people have questions, um, feel free to let me know and I can explain some more details. But I'll hand it back to you, Steve. Okay, there was only one more thing that I thought I would show people today and then we can take some questions. So I'll try and be fairly quick about it. Um, but some people on Thursday, uh, I showed my uh, exercise from lock fee that had oriented strike and dip symbols in it. So let me see if I can go there. Here we go. So I'm sorry, I need to be sharing my screen here. Please pardon my messy desktop. Let me get out of where I was there. But if you go back to this uh, set of links here and you click on this um, uh, virtual geologic mapping at lock fee, there is a file in there, which is a KML file. And in that KML file, let me just go there. So this is the exercise. By the way, this is a fantastic site um, that has been created on the NAGT website, Teaching with Online Field Experiences. Um, if you go there, there are a whole bunch of activities now. We're up to 23. Uh, my Blue Ridge Province exercises here. Uh, Drew Sandy Hollow exercises here. I think it's on the second or third page. Yeah, right here, Sandy Hollow. But there are exercises all over. It's become a really fabulous um, site for all sorts of different virtual field experiences that people have been working on this summer. But right near the end is this geologic mapping exercise at Lock Fee. 
And what you'll notice is this exercise uses web Google Earth, but it displays all the outcrops as oriented strike and dip symbols. Um, and basically these are just oriented lines in space that are drawn, which can be really tedious to do by hand, but we created a tool to do that. And so one of the tools here is this symbols tool. Okay, symbols tool for generating strike and dip symbols. And when you go there, I think I have it loaded already. This is what you see, okay? Um, basically it inputs a CSV file and it uses columns for the name of a point, longitude, latitude, the unit, symbol type, you know, is it bedding, foliation, lineation, the color, um, and it, you can just look at a standard uh, HTML color chart to get the color names that, that can be used. Um, the strike or the trend if it's a lineation, the dip or the plunge um, if it's a lineation. If it is a feature that doesn't have strike or dip, it'll just show up as a dot instead of a, a, instead of a orientation symbol. If you use dip direction, you can put that in, otherwise it assumes right-hand rule, and then any notes. So I'm just gonna really quickly show you how you do this. So let's say I'm going to use a, uh, oh, I know I put a, a CSV file here somewhere. Pardon me for just a second. Okay, there it is. Okay, so here's an example CSV file. Let me open it in Excel just to show you what it looks like. Come on. Cooperate. All right, I'm just going to double click on it, which means it'll probably open in, I don't know what it'll open in, numbers. All right, so here's the data file. I've got name, which is just a number in this case, longitude, latitude, formation, type, color, strike and dip, some dip directions, some not. Um, and this is my reference orientation to make sure everything was working right. But you could put any sort of outcrop observations in there. So that's what the uh, file looks like. And if I click choose file, there's example data. It brings it in. So now it's loaded it into symbols. Um, you can change any of these things. If you have them in a different order, you just change the header and choose what the header ought to be. Um, in this case, they're all lined up correctly, but they don't have to be. Um, you'll notice it says the data sets are okay if they're in green. They're probably okay if they're in uh, gray. Um, and if they're red, that's not good. In other words, I have a header um, at the top of my CSV file, so I would just get rid of it, the header. Um, once, I was, once I made sure everything was in the right column, I can choose the size of the symbol, the height of the symbol above the ground, the thickness of the line, the output data file. Um, and if you have a bunch of different units and you want to group them into folders, Web Google Earth does not allow you to create folders, but it'll recognize folders. So this is a way to sort of group things if you want to group them by folder. And then you just export it. Um, this is going to create the data.kml file. If I go into Google Earth, I can open file from my computer, data.kml. I was working in Ireland at the time, so that's where I created them. And there we go. All right. I actually gave you guys this uh, test CSV file, example data CSV, I think that's what it's called. Um, but if I zoom close to the surface, right, I mean, this is, here we have it. We've got a foliation symbol with a, a lineation at the same location, some other foliation symbols, um, bedding symbols. And again, these are raised quite a bit up off the ground surface, which is the default. But if I wanted to change that, I could just change that before I exported it. Usually what I have to do is once I get the export, I look at it on the map and then I adjust it. Um, but if that's something you think might be useful, feel free to use it. We're always looking for input on, you know, making it better. It doesn't handle photos at the moment, but we're going to get there. We're, we're going to build, build
build handling photos in there as well. Oh, each of these things, of course, are clickable, right? So it gives you the data in a pop-up window if, if you or a student click on it. Um, you'll notice over here, these are now folders because I told it to do folders. And if you click on a folder, it shows you all the individual data points that are in there. So, okay. I'm gonna stop because I know we don't have much time left, but maybe there's a few questions that Drew or I could address. I don't know, Drew, are there any that you want to call out? There's, you've been answering a bunch as things have gone along. I think there's, there's one little question in the middle that was, uh, I missed how to draw polygons. So I think um, that was just back in the project, right? Where you showed the place marker, there was also a chance to do polygons there or? Sure, yeah, I kind of went quickly through that. Um, but that same line tool, which appears on the bottom left when you're creating content, um, it's the same tool for both polygons and lines. You can, if you, you're just drawing a line, um, just double click wherever you want that line to end. If you want to make it into a polygon, you circle back to the starting point and close the shape by clicking on that start point with your create tool. Yeah, there we go. Steve's showing how to do this. So for those of us who are used to using ArcMap and you know it's entirely different editing tools, uh, this is refreshingly simple. And then of course you can change things like line weight, um, transparency, things of that nature. Okay. Yeah, people had questions about what kind of things you can embed. Um, my answer is that I haven't tried everything, but you know, if you've got a site that will generate an embed code, you might as well try it and see if it works. I don't think everything will work. Um, but yeah, there's lots of possibilities and things you can do that I'm sure we haven't covered here. Let's see. You cannot do topographic profiles, I'm sorry to say. Um, there is, let me, uh, sorry a sec. There is, um, I'm trying to share my screen. Come on, be good. There is a measuring tool, which is this guy over here, uh, measure distance and area. So you can do the measuring tool which is the similar to um, what you could do before. You can set it to all these different units, um, but unfortunately, you can't, you can't generate the total profile. Not that I know of anyway. But you can still measure it in smoots. So those of you that are from MIT, smoots are still in there anyway. And I think another thing that's missing, am I right, is the um, historical photography. That's, that's a really important point. Historical photography can be really useful from a geologic perspective of looking at sites. And no, historical photography is not in web Google Earth, nor is Google Mars or, or, the, or the versions of the, the moon that are in the desktop. Um, let's see, a couple more questions just came in. I missed how to add an ortho mosaic um, to Google Earth. If you'd like, I could share my screen again and go through that a little bit more slowly. I guess I'll go for it. Okay. Okay, so you should see my Arc Pro map with an ortho mosaic in there. And the format of that ortho mosaic is a TIFF. I generated this using drone deploy. And under geoprocessing in Arc Pro, there's a tool called layer to KML. And so the input arguments here are just which layer would you like to export? And then you tell it where to save. So I saved it as Ainsworth. KMZ on this desktop. It exported as a zipped KML because it does include that image. 
So I ran that tool and you see down here with the green checkbox that it completed successfully. I have my KMZ file here on the desktop. And yeah, that's a different window. Earth.google.com. So that's going slowly for whatever reason, but essentially you just need to import this KML file now. So projects, new project, import KML file from computer, find it on your desktop, and it brought it in. So there's my high resolution image. And what's cool is my neighborhood actually has three dimensional things like trees. So you get the, uh, you know, sub sub foot scale pixels here. I think they're actually just a few centimeters. So you get some really high resolution imagery that way. And of course you can download all kinds of imagery from various sources online. So if you want to bring that into your Google Earth projects, you can totally do that. Thank you for going over that again. Padura, I want to be uh, sensitive to the fact that we're now slightly over the hour. I think the very end of the chat, there was a, a number of things going back and forth about the pros and cons of Google Earth uh, web versus desktop. Um, I think we've talked about a lot of them and you can catch more of them in the chat. Uh, but I think a lot of it has to do with your particular learning goals um, and then with an eye to we're not sure how long that desktop will continue to be supported. Um, thank you. So hey um, Mitchell if you can please capture the chat so we could post it because I think there was a lot of things in the chat that might be good to capture. Um, thank you very much to Steve and Drew uh, for both of your webinars and to GSA and NAGT for sponsoring this and all of you for attending. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone.